Sponsored by 80,000 Hours. Click the link in the comments below to start planning a career that works on one of the world's most pressing problems. What is altruism? Very simply, altruism can be defined as behavior that is costly to the actor and beneficial to the recipient. Think of the pay it forward fad at coffee shops. Out of sheer coffee-based altruism, I pay for someone else's drink in advance, a behavior that costs me money for nothing in return but directly benefits the recipient with a free, caffeinated beverage. Altruism is a common theme across the world's religions as well. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus encourages his followers to give food to the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, and care for the sick. The Quran, on multiple occasions, calls for charitable giving. Let whatever of your wealth you spend be for parents, kinsfolk, orphans, the poor, and the traveler. And in Buddhism, generosity or charity is one of the paramitas, or perfections, which are noble attitudes or qualities of character developed and mastered by an enlightened being. But altruism has puzzled scientists when it comes to studying its evolutionary origins, because helping another organism does not seem like a winning strategy when it comes to survival of the fittest. Wouldn't it be more evolutionarily advantageous to be selfish? So how do we explain altruism as an evolved behavior, a behavior that evolved not just in humans, but across species over the course of millions of years? Some academics have suggested that religion may have played a role in this process as a biocultural phenomenon that promoted cooperation and group solidarity. But to answer this question, we need to turn to evolutionary biology, psychology, anthropology, and vervet monkeys. When talking about the evolution of altruism as an animal behavior, scholars generally refer to it as biological altruism. And there are a lot of examples of biological altruism across different animal species. Colony insects like ants and bees have frontline workers who will sacrifice themselves to protect the hive from invaders. Vampire bats are known to regurgitate blood they have just consumed and donate it to fellow bats. But one of the most striking examples of biological altruism is the vervet monkey, whose native habitat stretch from Ethiopia down to South Africa. Primatologists have found that vervet monkeys make sophisticated alarm calls, warning their fellow monkey compatriots of specific predators. In fact, vervet monkeys are estimated to have about 30 different alarm cries. The alarm vocalization for a leopard sounds more like a bark, while the alarm for a snake sounds more like a chattering. And the monkeys react differently based on the specific alarm they hear. When they hear the eagle alarm, they jump down from the trees and run into low-lying bushes. When they hear the leopard alarm, they do the opposite, jumping up into the trees. The scientists discovered this by playing recordings of the alarm calls and watching how the monkeys reacted, a type of experiment which I believe the monkeys would call a dick move. From an evolutionary perspective, this type of altruism seemingly contradicts Darwinian natural selection. Survival of the fittest doesn't seem to hold true for the monkey who raises the alarm. The most altruistic monkey, who always raises the alarm is playing death by leopard Russian roulette. The monkey draws the leopard's attention to itself, putting itself at risk of being killed and failing to pass on its genes to the next generation. You'd think the monkey who's a freeloader and never calls out an alarm would succeed the most, but scientists have found that biological altruism like this actually does make sense from a Darwinian perspective when we consider a kinship-based theory of altruism, or what's called the inclusive fitness theory. In general, the inclusive fitness theory suggests that organisms are more likely to show altruism to direct blood relatives. Thus, an altruistic act supports the survival of your own group. The genetic biologist W.D. Hamilton pioneered this theory back in the 1960s. Hamilton's rule says that altruism can evolve in a population if the cost to the potential donor is less than the benefit passed on to the donor's direct relatives. He even came up with an equation for the theory. R times B needs to be greater than C. B stands for the beneficial act, R stands for relatedness, how genetically close you are to the recipient of your altruism, and C, the cost, how much you will personally suffer. C needs to be less than the benefit to your direct relatives. The biologist J.S. Haldane illustrates this equation when he says, I jump into the river to save two brothers or eight cousins. The scholar of religion Connor Wood points out that Haldane's joke is meant to be taken literally. Due to gene recombination and sexual reproduction, full siblings carry one half of your genetic material, while your first cousins carry one eighth. Suddenly, the altruistic monkey makes more sense from a Darwinian perspective. Sure, I could be the overly altruistic vervet monkey, always giving away my position to the leopard by shouting the alarm. 
But even if my luck eventually runs out and I become monkey for breakfast, I also happen to always hang out with my direct relatives, and I just ensured the safety of all my immediate and extended family, little copies of my genes running off into the jungle to survive and reproduce another day. From the perspective of this theory, natural selection thus selects for traits that improve cooperation and reciprocity, specifically favoring behaviors that ensure the survival of related groups. This seems to be true for humans as well. Altruism is strongest for those who are most closely related, our siblings and our kids. Social scientists have even empirically confirmed that we're more willing to commit crime for our closest relatives. So the inclusive fitness theory argues that, like other primates, we humans have an innate social psychology baked into our system, a social psychology that was calibrated to life in the small-scale societies of our Paleolithic ancestors. In other words, we help our genetic relatives, and this evolutionary logic was eventually extended to include non-relatives. But how do we get from point A to point B? Altruism for genetic relatives to altruism for non-relatives. Because when most of us think about religiously codified altruism, we don't really think be kind to your immediate siblings and offspring so as to propagate your genetic material. So what gives? Before we get into that, I'm really excited to introduce today's sponsor, 80,000 Hours, a nonprofit that aims to help people have a positive impact with their career. It's co founded by the philosopher and ethicist William McCaskill, known for helping to launch the effective altruism movement. So, what's with that number 80,000? Well, that's roughly how long your career will be. 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, for 40 years. And deciding what to do with those 80,000 hours not only is an important decision, but it can also be a very difficult decision. That's where 80,000 hours comes in. Their website has tons of research about how to have a high-impact career, including in-depth career overviews of specific sectors, like information security or artificial intelligence policy. Their website also hosts a curated job board with hundreds of currently open career opportunities, targeting key problem areas like building effective altruism. They also publish a great podcast featuring conversations digging into some of the world's toughest problems and solutions. Just to be clear, 80,000 Hours is a nonprofit. They're fully philanthropically funded, everything they provide is free, and their only goal is to help you find a fulfilling, high impact career. To get started planning a career that works on one of the world's most pressing problems, join the newsletter at 80,000hours.org slash RFB. If you join now, you'll get a free copy of their in-depth career guide sent straight to your inbox. Again, just sign up at 80,000hours.org slash RFB. Okay, back to the show. Many of you might be thinking, biological altruism doesn't even sound like real altruism. When we generally think about altruism, we think of costly behavior for ourselves born out of a sense of intention to help others, including to help complete strangers. Altruism can involve doing things that might benefit future generations, even if you don't ever have kids yourself. It can involve doing things that benefit non-humans. So what about altruism beyond our direct relatives? The primatologist Franz de Waal calls this directed altruism. This is altruism in response to another's pain, need, or distress. Duvall argues that directed altruism is still an animal behavior not unique to humans. He cites research demonstrating that primates like bonobos and chimpanzees exhibit sympathetic behavior toward other primates, even across species. But humans evolved a better ability to take the perspective of others. Thus, the evolution of directed altruism may be directly tied to empathy the ability that allows one to quickly and automatically relate to the emotional states of others. And this is potentially a big deal. Imagine what goes into the evolution of empathy. We needed to evolve a high degree of social and emotional intelligence, the ability to compute what counts as a cost or benefit to the self and others, the ability to regulate social interactions and cooperate towards shared goals, which all involve culture. While basically all scientists agree that biological altruism like what we see in vervet monkeys probably got the evolutionary ball rolling, some don't think this alone explains the jump from biological altruism to directed altruism. These academics argue that human prosocial behavior is not solely the product of an innate psychology, but also reflects norms and institutions that have emerged over the course of human history. In other words, in order to explain the rise of altruism beyond biology, we need to examine cultural evolution. How norms, beliefs, values, rituals, styles of social hierarchy, and institutions may have played a role. 
And here is where religion comes in. Some scholars have argued that religion was an evolutionary adaptation that arose in early humans because it encouraged cooperation and other prosocial behaviors. Let me be clear, I'm not making a value judgment that says, therefore religion is good. The process of evolutionary adaptation is amoral. Some of the same aspects of religion that increase group solidarity and cooperation have the flip side that may increase negative behavior like intergroup conflict or targeting marginalized people in your group. So Scientists are not making a value judgment when they say religion is an evolutionary adaptation. They're simply identifying a process of making alterations or adjustments that improve the ability of a species or individual to survive. Already you might notice an issue here though. Evolutionary adaptation generally refers to a thoroughly biological process, adaptations that are hereditary and enable a species to pass on genes to the next generation. But the evolution of religion involves a cultural process, passing on cultural behaviors to the next generation. Scientists have noticed this too, which has led to a sharp debate in evolutionary science between inclusive fitness theorists and those who advocate for applying Darwinian logic to culture. In the words of the Harvard evolutionary biologist Joseph Henrich, the thrust of this line of research is that cultural evolution was likely a dominant force driving our species' genetic evolution over the last few hundred thousand years. This framework that joins biological and cultural evolution is called gene culture coevolutionary theory, which has three key points that feed back into each other. First, evolution gave rise to culture. In other words, we evolved psychological adaptations for acquiring beliefs, values, and practices. Once we have culture, a new system called cultural evolution begins. A new system that passes on these adaptations not through sexual reproduction, but by other methods, like teaching your kids specific beliefs about beings called gods, teaching them how to do specific behaviors that we now call ritual, and passing on myths, values, and beliefs through mechanisms like storytelling or sacred texts. This second system of cultural evolution creates a feedback loop called gene culture coevolution. New cultural adaptations create new pressures on our social and physical environments, which then affect our genes. Henrik uses the example of cooked food. Once we started cooking our food, that became a selective force that eventually shrunk our teeth and stomachs. Scholars like Henrik argue that cultural evolution selected for religion, because religion is a cultural package that contains a bunch of different beliefs and behaviors that, in his words, sustain in-group prosocial norms. In less fancy words, he means stuff like stronger group solidarity, cooperation, and altruism. So let's unpack the cultural package that is religion that might have helped the evolution of altruism. First, you have cognitive adaptations like belief in supernatural beings. Scholars in recent years have argued that belief in so-called big gods, all-knowing, all-powerful gods who care about morality, help to boost cooperation in early humans. Psychological experiments have demonstrated that when we know that someone else is watching, we act more altruistically. Also, when we know we can potentially face punishment for not contributing, we act more altruistically. As the argument goes, belief in all-powerful, all-knowing gods that are always watching and can punish you for wrongdoing may have boosted cooperation in early human society, and cultural evolution selected for these beliefs when societies became too large for individuals to monitor each other's social norms. Next, there are rituals. Religion often involves costly behaviors like sacrificing expensive animals, spending time in prayer rather than spending that time hunting or farming, and holding to high commitment practices like abstaining from certain behaviors or foods. Social psychologists have demonstrated that high cost behaviors like these filter out freeloaders from your society, leaving behind highly committed individuals with strong in-group solidarity, who are more likely to show altruism to each other regardless of blood relations. A Darwinian model of cultural evolution assumes that competition between groups should favor rituals that would promote deeper commitments to beliefs and values that increase in-group cooperation and solidarity, such as altruism and self-sacrifice, which would help these groups outcompete other groups with less effective ritual belief combinations. In other words, it's not just survival of the fittest, but survival of the most social, survival of the most effective ritual belief combos. So the evolutionary stories of altruism and religion may intertwine because, as Henrik says, at the population level, 
it is much better to be social than it is to be smart. He goes on to say, even the smartest among us could not possibly achieve in a single lifetime a tiny fraction of what it took for a pre-industrial society to thrive. Thus, cultural evolution favored cultural packages that boosted cooperation, which in turn allowed some groups to outcompete other groups and pass on those cultural packages to the next generation. This area of research remains hotly contested. As I said earlier, many biologists are not convinced by these cultural evolutionary models. But if the gene culture co-evolutionary theorists are correct, altruism may have evolved because our early ancestors decided that the best way to live is be social one to another.